By the way, how many people here are developers versus uh, like blockchain investors? How many are developers? Do you mind raising your hand? Okay, good. Uh, developers who have developed outside of blockchain? Yeah, some? Oh, okay, good. So this, uh, my talk, is this the? Uh, yeah, you first the green one. Green button advances. So my talk is uh, a little different from the last one uh, in that I focus on items themselves and items in secondary markets. So I've been doing that for about uh, oh, 20 years, taking virtual items and allowing people to convert them into real cash, right? And now we're moving into allowing them to convert them into crypto and using the blockchain. But um, as someone who has traded probably more virtual items than anyone on earth, billions of dollars through our marketplace, uh, I'm gonna give to some extent just a, a dose of reality as to how the world works today and then perhaps the value of the blockchain. Uh, because it's not obvious that the blockchain solves all problems or even we need them to solve all problems. So first, why do gamers need a blockchain? Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, it's a very technology centric thing to say to yourself, I have a tool, what can I use it for, right? I'm sure we've all seen that, particularly in the blockchain area. There's a lot of experimentation, which is good, but often there's silly, silly use cases, right? You don't necessarily need a blockchain for the vast majority of the things you do. But when you do need it, there's nothing like it. Um, I would say to you that the main reason you want a blockchain if you're a video game player, or perhaps even a video game developer, is for collecting and trading. The market for collecting and trading is huge. For uh, PC-based games, it's about $50 billion a year. Now that is what we call a secondary market, meaning that's what gets traded outside of the video game world, right? The video game developers, they like a very closed world. They like to control their economy. I'll talk more about that. But outside of it, people do like the ability to convert those items into cold hard cash, or in this case, maybe crypto. And there's a bunch of reasons why when you're trading, the blockchain can be quite useful. Um, so this is, as many of you may know if you're video gamers, that's a, a CSGO item, right? Uh, no, uh, no virtual item there. That is what we call a skin. Right? It's a virtual item that gets slapped on the item. By the way, that, that skin goes for about $35,000. Right? Just the skin, not the rifle, just a paint job. Uh, people trade these things. They trade billions of dollars of these things. Today, anyway, without a blockchain. Now, our company, Opskins, does a lot of uh, e-commerce, a lot of trading, using cryptos as a form of payment. It's terrific as a form of payment because there's no chargeback. It's got its drawbacks, it takes time, sometimes two minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 60 minutes to confirm uh, the, the trade. That's, that's a drawback, it is getting fixed. So. The reason people would pay $35,000 for a frickin' skin is because they get something out of it. Not just income, but of course social status, trading is a huge part of, of it's almost an extension of the game itself. Uh, we should point out though that a lot of games don't like people trading, right? And that's because their game mechanic, the game design, doesn't allow them to profit from it. Over the years, I've tried to educate many game publishers about why they should embrace it, but many don't really understand secondary markets. They don't understand the economics of secondary markets, so they think that money is being taken out of their pocket. I beg to differ. I think it causes people to have a lot more engagement in the game, but these are the reasons, for the most part, people who have virtual items want to trade them. And of course, this here. Uh, it's fun, it's exciting, often you'll get an item. Remember, uh, skins, which are a form of virtual item, are unique. 
Uh, that point sometimes is lost. They're unique. Every single skin, billions of them, are unique. One of a kind. And as a result, when you get one, and maybe you got it cheap because somebody didn't realize what they have, this drives engagement. Uh, one aside I would make right now is, and it's true of most games, if for those of you who remember the first Flash games, they were really lame, people criticized them, didn't even call them games. Then mobile games came along, and what did people say? Uh, those aren't real games, right? Flash are real, those aren't. Now we have HTML5, those kind of came and not much, went with them, now blockchain games. Uh, but any type of technology when it's first introduced, People tend to focus on the tech first and then the experience. But at the end of the day, people are looking for a high. And that's the reason they like to play games. It's also the reason they like to trade. Uh, the number one activity for many games is trading. What about uniqueness? Uh, everyone I hope here has heard of ERC-721. Um, Again, skins, which is what I specialize in, are unique. Every single skin is unique. But I can tell you this, there are hundreds of games with skins. Most of those, no one wants to trade the items. And if you want to know why, it, which I'm going to get into, a whole bunch of things have to follow. And the punchline here is, you can't just make a game, have a unique item, and expect anyone to care. The secondary market needs a whole bunch of other stuff. Unique traits are really valuable for one particular thing, uh, that's holding the price of the items, but they don't drive excitement. The real magic is in the secondary markets. So if you want to have a successful game, and this can be a blockchain game with an ERC-721, that's great. But keep in mind, if it's about trading, you need to have secondary markets. And you need the secondary markets markets to be able to operate effectively. In um, 2004, some friends and I started IGE. IGE is a, uh, uh, was really the first marketplace that allowed people to trade virtual items for cash. And, uh, became very, very successful. Of course, these were virtual items that were not unique. And as a result, they didn't go up in price. They, uh, it, after a while, the economy gets manipulated. You get too many of the same thing, value drops. Obskins started with the notion of skins needed their own marketplace. And now skins, as I mentioned, are probably a $50 billion market. Very, very big. and specific. As a result of having unique items, you need unique ways to track those items. Uh, the blockchain can help. What we saw in 2016 and 17 was the ability to use the blockchain for secondary markets. But as I, I, I've alluded to, uh, uh, the blockchain is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all the problems out there. It does a few things really well. So. It strengthens the role of secondary markets. The, the speaker who was on here uh, a moment ago, he mentioned that when uh, a game goes away, the item disappears. Uh, that is a problem. It's particularly a problem when you're paying tens of thousands of dollars for the item. So while it's experimental, we don't know if this is going to be a big draw, and I think that's true of many things. I've been a lifelong investor, and you often think something makes sense, it actually doesn't. Or you think it's valuable, but the consumers don't care. I do believe a lot of consumers will care about the fact that even if the video game goes away, the blockchain will keep those items and you can continue to trade them. Um, the blockchain does something else which is the most radical part, I think, of, uh, of item trading, which is there is a war going on, and it's been going on since I got involved with cryptos and got involved with virtual items, which is the creator of the items, right, the video game people, they don't like secondary markets for the most part. Now, some of that is because they feel like that revenue from the secondary markets is being taken from them. And it's a really curious thing to me why that's the case. The automobile industry understands that the value of their primary market is enhanced because people trade 
sell their, mar their cars in the secondary market. It's the exact same thing for housing. Can you imagine buying a house and not being able to sell the house when you're done with it? But for some reason, video game designers, video game publishers have always been very protective of their environment. So what blockchain does, which I love, is it, it essentially connects the two. If you are designing a game with a blockchain base, then by definition, if it's a standardized token, ERC-20, ERC-721, the third party networks, these systems, these merchants, they can trade those items. And in fact, you're signaling that that is part of the game experience. I believe that that's a huge and valuable contribution to, to video gaming, but we will see. If we find that a lot of these next generation ERC721 and ERC20 uh, tokens, if they lead to a flourishing secondary market, I think you're gonna see blockchain-based games uh, move very quickly into the mainstream. If they don't, if that doesn't happen, then I'd say blockchain-based games, from my perspective, haven't yet figured out the killer app. One of the reasons why video game developers don't like secondary markets is because of random asset appreciation. It's kind of like the Beanie Babies effect. You will have items that wind up becoming very, very expensive in a secondary market. That no one has a problem with. What they have a problem with is when they start to go down because then people get upset. It's this roller coaster ride. So it's a curious thing though about blockchain and crypto people, we like the roller coaster ride. In fact, if there was not a roller coaster, who would want to own a crypto? The whole point is volatility. You get in high, maybe you sell, you buy in low, but that in itself is a game, make no mistake. Going and buying cryptocurrencies is a game, especially the altcoins, the small cap altcoin ones. So I think this is one thing which is a negative to the traditional video, video game players and video game publishers, but in fact for blockchain based games might be a positive. And as I said, what we often hear is, oh, the market for these items is too erratic, publishers don't like it. In the blockchain world, I think we'll probably celebrate it. So this leads to uh, what's out there today. I've been, I was involved when the flash game craze began, then the mobile game craze. Now we've got blockchain-based games. Uh, one criticism I would make of blockchain-based game, just the community, is we are way too technology-centric. No one really cares about how Android works or about how iOS works. They care about the gameplay. Same with Flash. Flash, there was a little talk of the, of the technology and then we went right to, but check out the cool games. So I think we need to get to that point quickly. And one big part of secondary markets is confidence. There is no market if there is no confidence. And today, how many people, by the way, have bought ERC721 games? Our tokens, so maybe 30%. If your experience is like mine, you buy them, you think they're cool, but these things trade very slowly and they generally trade for below the price you paid for them. That does not instill confidence. And there's a reason, by the way, why they don't trade at reliable prices, either being flat or even gradually going up over time. And that has to do with the ecosystem. Um, I don't have enough time to describe the skin ecosystem, the skin item ecosystem, but I can tell you it is tens of thousands of companies, tens of thousands of companies that play all these different roles. There are secondary markets in every country with every different fiat, including now crypto, and with a variety of games, thousands of games, different secondary markets that specialize in one game, one currency, one geographic region, facilitators. Those are like affiliates, right? Arbitrageurs, appraisers. There is a vast, vast community of people who constitute the economy of these items. So you can't just build an ERC721 game, have a token, put it out there, and expect it to magically have a stable price, go up gradually over time. You need an ecosystem. And ecosystems take time and a lot of nurturing. So 
Before we see really successful blockchain-based games, you will see this. You will see an emerging ecosystem. Um, how many people have transferred ERC-721s, right? Yeah, a little different than transferring like a CSGO skin, right? It is a pain in the ass. It is not ready for prime time. If you look at just downloading MetaMask, remember, we're trying to expand this market beyond the crazies who are really into crypto. Because there's about 15 million people globally who buy, sell, hold cryptos. There's about 400 million who are in the skins market, the virtual items market. So we want to get those people into our market, this new blockchain-based gaming market. But if you have to begin with, let's do MetaMask, and this is something I, I put together, by the way, and that is a very stylized list. It's actually longer. But if you want to trade an NFT today, this is what you go through. And having done it and having helped people do it, this is not fun. And if games aren't fun, they're not going to catch on. This is probably the biggest friction point we have in blockchain-based games. To me, this is how it should work. You go to the site, get an account, deposit money, real money, complete the purchase. If you're not using fiat, the blockchain-based games will never work. That's my belief. Or if they work, they'll be very, very small. And then it takes too much time. Not enough is, not enough is mentioned about this. Uh, there is no consumer e-commerce experience that is going to work if you're waiting 30 minutes to check out or 20 minutes to check out. You know, if it's a good day, it's two minutes to check out. That takes too long. So EOS, I do believe, will solve that problem, but it's a promise, not yet a reality. But you can't expect a mass market to develop when people are just sitting there twiddling their thumbs for the next thing to happen. And as a result, I would say, lots of technology has to be built. Uh, it reminds me of, Here's a slide, the dot-com era. Keep in mind, uh, the internet got created 30 years before it became mass market, right? Uh, you had many, many years in the 90s of people just figuring this stuff out. And then new business models. I would like to see the new business model piece. So as a venture capitalist, what I can tell you is new technologies typically get used to do something everybody else already does. In, in the original internet, it was, hey, we've got catalogs we mail to people, we'll put them online. Then when you get to new business models where you can do something you could never do before because of that technology, that's where it blows up. Something like a price line comes along. Impossible without the internet. When we start to come up with new business models, new business models that we bring to video gaming because of the blockchain, expect the market to flourish. And so if you kind of level, take a look at what we had with dot-com and see where we are here, one, I would say it's moving much faster than the dot-com experience. We're starting to see new business models right now, but still a few years off. DAX, by the way, distributed autonomous corporations or communities. Uh, 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 I think that is the Satoshi future, by the way. Ultimately, all the things we do are not going to have a human-centric uh, uh, point, they will be DAX. DAX, of course, is where the software does virtually all of it. As we put AI into smart contracts, that's going to help a lot. That's wax, and uh, I think that is it. So a lot of thoughts packed in there. Hopefully you got something useful out of it.